Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Hello. What? I'm sure Mr. McNeese will join us, but I'll I'll send him a little message. Okay, lovely. Yeah, you dropped me a little email yesterday, just just asking um, if a few details, which I gave him. So um, hopefully he'll um, he'll be in problem. Well, I think he's just just logged on. I'm just going to promote him uh, to panelists. Yeah. Yeah. Just try and get his audio on a second. Ah. Hello. Uh, we can't can't hear you. Um, hang on. Uh, get... There we go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh How my god. Doing? Gosh, you have a different background, Ian. A what? <laughs> you have a different background. A different background. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I see. So you've got your camera low down and it's looking up at you. Is that right? Oh, is that what it is? Okay, yeah. is that better? Yeah, that's but, fine. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely fine. Uh, right. Well, I just want to say to Ian, th thank you very much for, for joining us. It's very much appreciated uh, to have you involved. Um, so it's lovely to, uh, lovely to see you, to meet you. Thank you very much. Th uh, nice to be here. Wonderful. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to ask you both, um, uh, well, well, I'll start with, with Ian first. How did the Royal Churchill come into your life? What was the process? Okay, the process was this. Is that, I mean, at the time I was doing a play at the National Theatre about Harold Macmillan. Jeremy Irons was playing Harold Macmillan and I was playing Winston Churchill. Right. And the casting director and I think the producer came to see the show because they were looking for a Winston Churchill to be in in Doctor Who. They've hmm. written this character, so uh, so that's uh, that, that's how I, I then got an offer, which was really sweet. That they said, um, "Would I come and, and do it?" Uh, and so that's that's really how I got the role because I was already playing him. Uh -huh. so, you know, so, so, so then I had to change over from doing a theatre job to a TV job. I so I had to bring him right down and make him more accessible and more not quite as big, you know, mm. as you do on the stage, but that's really how I got it. Hmm. Uh, so, so when you prepared for the, uh, the, the on-stage role, did you look at a lot of Churchill footage and... Oh, goodness me, yes. I, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I spent a lot of time researching him. I mean, I did, uh, I watched a lot of uh, uh, TV movies, Albert Finney, and all those other characters that have played him over the years, uh, um, Brian Cox and other people like that, and uh, just several actors who had, um, I got all the all the videos and watched those. And of course I watched, uh, uh, I listened to all the speeches mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that you can get hold of too. I then went down to Chartwell to his home. Yeah. And uh, I went there and, uh, and, and saw where he lived and where he painted and, uh, and all the rest of it, and then did a lot of research reading up and stuff like that about him and about his uh, wife and about his uh, about his families and that. And so there was that. And then I went to Blenheim Palace, mm -hmm. saw him where he was buried. So, so I saw that too. So I did a lot of a lot of research for the play. So it was already done. Really, I'd already done that before I started the role. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And because uh, you didn't, you don't do an impression Churchill on Doctor Who, but you just don't get the, the essence of, of the man, I take That's it. That's exactly right. That's a phrase that I used when I talked to various people about, about doing him, rather than doing an impression. I mean, I did, I, I mean, there, there are many little hooks that you can hang him on because he had this, um, he had a sort of speech impediment. He, I mean, his S's were slightly sibilant uh, and and so he, and he had these extraordinary phrases like he will call nazis nazis mm. he, he called them nazis which is very funny so i put that i put that in the play which was good and and, 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 and so, so there are all sorts of little hooks hooks to hang it on hmm. i just had a little audience question come in and, and i'll put it to both of you um perhaps start with, with ian again um do you prefer characters that are perhaps based on real people, or do you prefer to have a, a blank slate? And is there advantages 
all different matches for both. Simon, you go first. Um, I, th I think, uh, if I'm absolutely honest, I thoroughly enjoy being offered a role in a new play mm -hmm. uh, so that the character can be built over a period of rehearsal. And so if I'm the first one to play it, that's quite good fun. But at the same time, I can say it's a, a, a huge responsibility to play either a person who's still living uh, or is still within living memory. But, uh, but it's a challenge and everybody enjoys a challenge. I think, I hope that all makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, how about you, Ian? I mean, I, I think, I mean, Sam is absolutely right. So, so, so that, that is part of it. I mean, I've been fortunate to play several characters which uh, people know about. I, I mean, I did um, Cardinal Wolsey at, uh, um, at the Globes. So that was another well-known character. And so it's like, um, it's tricky because certainly with, with someone like Churchill, I mean, everybody has got their own feelings about Churchill, so, so you had a stab of it. And that. I, rem I remember I got terrified when his family came to see um, the show with the last time. So that was terrifying, doing it in front of people who actually knew the individual. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, that was tricky. But like, you know, but you just get on and do it, don't you? I, I mean, it's one of those things that you have to take on uh, uh, and, try and try and do it as best you can. It, uh, and whichever character you're playing is enjoyable. You know? yeah. Um, so, Victory of the Daleks was a very successful episode, and then you came back, um, uh, the most meaty one in the, the Wedding of River Song. You know what? I came back and I thought to myself, I'm now doing a scene with a man with a green face, and I thought, Winston Churchill can come back at any point now. I mean, that's it now. I mean, I'm, you know, I've got a, you know, I've got an open sesame here, you know, really. I mean, goodness me, Blake Churchill with a man with a green face. I mean, from then on, it's it's... It's all upward, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so, so, what do you think, Simon, about um, when you're playing against aliens or perhaps um, uh, green screen? Is, is that more? I, I mean, I was very. I tell you what, the thing is, this is is, is, is to appear in Doctor Who is any is great anyway, because you know the world and his wife can be offered roles. I mean, it's like they can have whoever they want now because it's such a hugely successful series and they do i mean they've got some terrific actors playing all these roles and so to, to be to be offered a role in it anyway is great we offered dr you know churchill is, is fantastic but then to be in, in, in an episode with daleks i mean come on i mean it just doesn't get any better than that does it really i mean that was just the cream on the cake so to actually be in an episode of doctor who with daleks was fantastic i have to say so that was a that was a huge, huge plus. I'm very excited because I grew up. I mean, my doctor that I remember growing up was, um, uh, was um, of course, was uh, Tom Baker. And so mm. uh, and years later, I remember going to do a, a big finish um, uh, audio book. And, and um, suddenly I had to go down to sort of Tunbridge Wells and I thought, well, why can't we do it in London? They said, you just go down to Tunbridge Wells. So I went down there. And coming through the door of this tiny little studio in the middle of nowhere, still in his pajamas, was Tom Baker. Because he yeah. only lived down the road. <laughs> and he had a cup of coffee in his hand and said, well, let's do it, shall we? And that was it. That was, so that was a treat to work with him after mm. all those years, I have to say. And, and to, for him to be there as my... You know, as my Doctor Who, uh, um, you know, God, as it were, yeah, it was was great. Uh, and were you both surprised when Big Finish called and wanted to expand your your characters? Maybe start. Of course, with... that that was wonderful to actually do box sets of of, of, of Churchill. Those audio box sets were fantastic, and I think that. But what was what was so funny was that. Of course, they didn't have the money to employ all the doctors. So what did I have to do? I had then had to sort of do all the doctors myself. I had to sort of, as Churchill, as they say, you know, and as a, then do all, all these characters. And so, so I think, uh, which one was it? Was it Eccleston, I, I think, or uh, something like that. Or one of them, I think it was more, I can't remember which one it was, but they said, can you do it a bit more London, Ian, or something like that? Well, what the hell is Churchill, isn't it, for God's sake? It's like, come on, 
<laughs> so it was a joy having done all the box sets where I played all the doctors as well, as it were, mm. uh, um, to, to actually then start doing a few, like I've done one with um, um, Paul McGann now, and I've done one with Sue Esther, and so as Churchill. So that, mm. that was a plus to be able to do them with the actual doctors having not having to do those but those roles as well at the same time, which is funny. Yeah, well, wonderful. And how about you, you Simon? What was it like when Big Finish uh, uh, called? Well, I was very lucky that uh, quite early on uh, when I first sort of did Doctor Who, I ended up at Gallifrey in LA and amongst the people to be sitting next to me was Gary Russell, who's well associated mm. with Doctor Who. And he just turned to me and asked if I'd done any big finish. And I said I'd tried, but they never called me. And he tapped, <laughs> he tapped my knee and he said, leave it to me. And that was in the February. And then in the April, he called me. And the first job he offered was for me to be um, a psychotic elevator <laughs> hmm. uh, in an uh, Iris Wild Time story. And then a few months later, he called me again uh, to be uh, uh, the uh, Caval, uh, Caval, who was the Minister of Science in a Gallifrey story. So that's hmm. very good. And then it all went a bit quiet again. Uh, but then the, uh, they did the 11th Doctor Chronicles. Mm -hmm. Alas, they couldn't get uh, Matt Smith, but they had the wonderful Jacob Dudman, who's a very good. He does an extraordinary David Tennant, an excellent Matt Smith, uh, and a very passable Peter Capaldi as well. So he's very, very talented. So that mm -hmm. was nice. And then uh, this year, we uh, Dorian came back. Uh, for an episode of the Jenny series, the spin-off Jenny, who yeah. of course is the the Doctor's daughter, so <laughs> very exciting. But of course, over the time, things have had to be di uh, dealt with differently, especially with uh, the pandemic on. So, yeah. whereas whereas previously I used to go to the studio and we'd all be all be in our own little hubs, you know, our own little pods, and we could at least see each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this this time with Jenny, I had to record it at home uh, and just have voices coming down the line. So, but it mm -hmm. was all done and it's all excellent. And Jenny is out now. It's been out now for about two months. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I want to answer this question I've seen off on the screen here. It says, hmm. have you any happy memories of Edge of Darkness? Well, I have to say that last Sunday, only a couple of days ago, I went to the London Film Fair convention and who should be there as well but Charlie Kay. And Charlie Kay was Pendleton to my Harcourt in Edge of Darkness. And we hadn't seen each other for years and years and years. So that was a treat to mm. actually turn up at the same convention and be there. And of course, they made a huge deal of it. So we had our photographs together and we'd signed photographs together. And it was, it was lovely. It was lovely. So yes have very, very happy memories. We had no idea that it was going to be as big successful as it was. And of course, Martin Campbell went on to make, the director went on to do the Bond films and Zorro and all that sort of stuff as well. So it was a huge, I mean, Edge of Darkness uh, holds so many memories because you have these things throughout your career that sort of, you know, sort of uh, um, push you on into another stratosphere. And that was certainly one of them. That mm. was a, Big, uh, big step forward for me, and, and, and so, so that was not really happy, happy, happy memories. Absolutely true of Edge of Darkness. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, and what was it like working with, with Martin Campbell, um, the director? Martin Campbell. <laughs> I always remember this phrase. Okay, Ian, let's do one more. Let's put it to bed. Put it to bed. So that would be talking about a take that you were going to do, and, and it was a phrase. He was known as Zebedee because. Uh, um, the Magic Roundabout had this character that bounced up and down all the time called Zebedee, and he was known because he bounced up and down. He had so much energy, this man. He would turn up, right? He would turn up at the set uh, about two or three hours before everybody else, and he'd worked out everything that he was going to do on that location. He would come very early and he'd worked it out, so everybody turned up. I remember one day he gave this list to one of the assistant directors where he wanted two ambulances, one police car, this and that. And they had they hadn't organized it. We, you know, this is something you do 
days and weeks before all the mm. preparation, but he wanted it that day. He wanted it by the afternoon. Of course, they got it for him. But he had this idea, and it was a very good idea that that, um, that he would put them in the shot, and, and, and it was great. He's, he's fantastic, and he's very, very fortunate that uh, years later he asked me to go to Australia to be in a movie called No Escape, which was uh, had Ray Liotta, the guy from Goodfellas, in, and, and so that was a that was a huge, uh, uh, wonderful thing that, that I was able to do to be in an action movie. No escape uh, um, with him. So, so yes, Martin Campbell, uh, I hold very dear in my memory. Hmm. That's wonderful. Um, I was just wondering, um, before you you both had entered the Doctor Who world as as uh, as you being in the show, did you watch the the new series, or was it more the old series that you were familiar with by the by the time you were casting? You go, Simon. Uh, well, I I am two years older than Doctor Who, so I was two when uh, it all started. I don't quite remember the first episode when it went out, uh, but I do remember William Hartnell. And so I have followed Doctor Who, really, from William Hartnell changing to Patrick Triton. And then when the uh, new series came back uh, with Christopher Eccleston, I was right in, and I've watched every episode since. Hmm. Yeah, so, uh, but it wasn't until I was actually filming an episode hmm. and I saw the TARDIS on set, I suddenly became quite emotional. Hmm. Uh, and uh, up until that point, I always said uh, I was a follower of Doctor Who, but I can now say uh, I am a fan. Hmm. So, fantastic, uh, Simon. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I I remember the scene. Where were we filming? It was in um, it was the the fight scenes in uh, A Good Man Goes to War, hmm. and it was filmed in uh, an aircraft hangar, uh, RAF's whatever in Wales, and um, and it was done at sort of two o'clock in the morning, freezing, freezing cold. As you walked in, they'd obviously be needing the dry ice and whatever, so there was an atmosphere. Uh, and the TARDIS was lit from above. And it was just so magical. And I found myself going up to it to touch it. Mm. It was... Uh, I didn't quite kiss it, but, you know, it was... <laughs> it, 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 was it was very emotional. Mm. It's, it's strange. Yeah. How about you, Ian? How familiar were you with the show? Uh, do you know what? I mean, I hadn't watched any of them. I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, my early days, I said, was spent with Tom Baker, but I hadn't watched any of the new series until uh, I got it. And then I started watching some back, back mm. shows of it just to get a hang of it. I, and, but, but I was just... Um, what I do remember very, uh, very fondly is working um, with Matt, Hmm. Smith, uh, because it was only I think the second one that he'd done, and he was still, he was still very um, working crazy, crazily to be as inventive as he could be, hmm. and, and and so it was all new to him still, and he was still trying things out, and he was terrific. I, I mean, just his energy and and and, and just his uh, inventiveness was terrific, and uh, of course Karen, her legs go all the way up, don't they? Quite frankly, she's an adorable creature. Yeah. And I fell totally in love with her. There was a very, very funny uh, thing that happened. Uh, um, apparently, th there was one evening where um, apparently he'd, he'd phoned Karen and said, Karen, turn on the television, it's McNeese, it's McNeese. He's in Ace Ventura when nature calls. You've got to see it, you've got to see it. And they came in the next day and, and <laughs> just told me all about watching that extraordinary thing with Jim Carrey up and down the, uh, up the wazoo, I mean, which was very funny. So that was, that mm. was a very sweet little memory of that, I have to say. Mm. Terrific guys. Mm. And of course, the wonderful moment where I went back into it, having, you know, left it and then going back in was, was terrific. It was, you know, it was like seeing old friends again. Mm. So that was very, that was very nice to, to be able to do that, I have to say. I mean, there were there were my, my two memories of Matt Smith was well three really. Firstly, he's a very kind and considerate actor. Yep. Uh, 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 the other thing which surprised me is that he is quite shy. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, he's also very cheeky. And he very kindly, particularly when I was the head in the box, he did all the reverses. Because sometimes, especially with a lead actor, you'd get a stand in. But he did all the rest. So when you see the doctor's uh, shoulder from behind, that is Matt Smith. But of course, he has this twinkle in his eye and he tries to make you laugh. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be very dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very sweet and he looked after me very well because yeah. there was a couple of times, I don't know if it happened with Ian, but a couple of times they, they'd sort of write, ready? And uh, right, so that's ready to take a shot and blah, blah, blah. And with the head of the box, they closed the box. So I'm in it, can't hear it. And then nothing, no action. You're thinking, what the hell's going on? And it's because they just suddenly thought of something else and were talking amongst themselves. Uh, and then on one occasion, I, I did hear Matt go, oh, God, we've forgotten about Simon. <laughs> right? and, and he came over and he opened my box. And as the door opened, there was a... <laughs> right there. And That's I was great. absolutely dripping. And he was very, very kind. Uh, he was apologetic. And he made sure that I got a, 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 a cup of cold water with a straw. <laughs> oh, and the, nice. because nice. I was literally stuck because I was inside a bigger box so mm. it was only my head in this small box so I couldn't do anything and so so that's what I appreciate about uh, fellow actors really and with Matt Smith yeah uh, and at that time he'd just come back from New York as well on some promotional thing so his body clock was all over the place he must have been knackered right mm. But there we go. But a very kind, sweet man. Hmm. The thing uh, that we have to talk about a little bit is 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 how I met Simon. Uh, uh, hmm. uh, was that um, we uh, uh, this extraordinary thing happened? Conventions, Doctor Who conventions came knocking on my door, and and we've been all over. Simon and I have been all over the world with these. All over the world. Not yeah. only that, but we've been on a cruise around the Caribbean. For goodness' sake, I mean, it's just a joke. Yeah. Yes. Doctor Who, Doctor Who cruise. They say. Yes. I don't know what. I mean, but Simon and I, I mean, Australia, New Zealand, America. I mean, it's just endless, endless of all these incredible Doctor Who conventions that we've all been to, and we became friends because of that, which was great. So, so that's it, it, absolutely, huge um, thing that's and I, I'd like to I'd like to give a little nod to one of our bookers. His name is Matthew Campbell, because at a, at a certain point, when he was getting us events, he was sort of saying, uh, uh, "Well, Simon could come too if you want Ian." <laughs> <laughs> so we so we ended up going as a double act. Yes, and, yes, it, yes, and it was really it was good fun. Hmm. I must admit, uh, or is still good fun given the opportunities. Yeah. So, Doctor Who for you, for you guys is is something that just keeps on giving. There's no negatives to being in, in, associated with uh, Doctor Who. Oh, I don't, I'm not sure of a negative, really. I mean, it is the spin-offs, as Ian says, and hmm. because of Doctor Who, uh, I've now become a, a, a published author. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I do get asked to give little talks here, there, and everywhere. Uh, yes. I've got a question here. Uh, it says yeah. um, for, for for Ian and Simon. It says you've both done a variety of roles in film and TV and stage and audio. Are you happier doing that, or would you have liked to have had a role in a soap opera for a number of years? Well, I, do you know what? I got that. I mean, I suppose Bert Large and Doc Martin could be. A bit mm. of a soap character, couldn't it? Because we've done it for so long now. I mean, the, mm. since 2004. So that really is running along those lines, I would have thought. And next year, we're doing this 10 series. And, uh, you know, uh, that's fantastic to, to be able to, to to have done so many. So, yes, you know. How about you? What, what do you say about that, Simon? Well, I suppose having turned 60 would be a nice pension, wouldn't it, to, to be in a regular... So in a regular, regular soap. Soap one, yes, exactly. Yes, I, all, I all you producers and people out there, think of, think of Simon. <laughs> he wants to get back in there as a soap actor. I, I, oh, I, no. I would like to, before they knock it on the head, I would like to be in uh, an episode of Holby or Casualty. Uh, 
Yes, uh, that would be good, wouldn't it? Really? Yes. Yeah, because uh, I, I, I have to concede that there, I, there isn't the time to watch every single soap. Mm. Uh, uh, every and... night, every night, I go to bed watching an episode of Ed, of uh, uh, of EastEnders. So there we are. <laughs> you know, I'm a fan of EastEnders. I have to yeah. say, every night, half mm. an hour just to put me off to sleep, and it does. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I still think of myself as a jobbing actor and whatever comes along. Uh, I have to confess, sometimes uh, it is a bit of a mistake, but generally speaking, if somebody says uh, we would like to offer you before they've said the word you, I say yes. Hmm. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Philip, I have to go in a minute. Is there anything else that you want to ask me? Uh, yes, so you have a, uh, some fantastic scenes with Matt Smith in the Wedding River Song. You as the, em the emperor. Um, what was it like to film those that those lovely scenes with Matt? You know what the thing is. This is, is is I remember. I remember thinking, what the hell is this all about? I had no idea what it was about. And I remember <laughs> asking the director, and he said, "Well, I haven't got a clue either. So just just yeah. get out there and have fun." And so that mm. was really how we played it, really, because mm. it was so. A bleak. It was so off the wall. It was so uncanny. So yes, mm. no, and was like all those things. I mean, w working with Matt was a joy. Mm. So so really, yes. But please, please write in. Mm. Please write in and tell me what it was all about because I have no idea. I mean, what did you um, f f think of Stephen Moffat uh, as is writing him as a because it is fantastic ideas that that yeah. he had. Um, Absolutely, yes. No. So no, no. I, I mean, he's a huge star, isn't he? And, and, and it was really nice to meet him along the way, which was good. So, yeah, no, no, I have to thank it. I mean, I mean quite frankly, I mean, I mean what was, what's was been really lovely is the amount of people and young kids who apparently, and their parents say, you know, you are thought of now as Churchill, but when they, when they, when they look at, right, in history lessons and stuff like that, they say, oh, well, that's Ian, Ian McNeese in, in Winston Churchill, you know, Dr. Who. He's Winston Churchill. <laughs> I've thought of that. So I have, I've got a lot to thank, thank I mean, people for in that I mean, direction. It's, it's very possible that some schools might show you as a Dr. Yes. Who. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Hmm. So anything else? Or, or, or uh, well, I want to ask, um, uh, 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 Joe of, of Calvin Gillen. Yes, no, I mean, like the same thing. I mean, the thing is this, is that, I mean, what what was very evident during the show was was how good these people were as actors. Hmm. And she was so good and so quick at what she did and so instinctive. And so I mean, and it's always a joy working with people who you consider to be very, very good. And she was and still is and, and mm. is still doing some terrific work out there. Yes, no. Mm. And such a nice person. That's the other thing. They both were absolute mm. joy to work with and so nice to be around. So, yeah, no joy, just mm. joy. And uh, you and, and Simon have done a documentary, I believe, together. Simon um, will talk about that. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, there's a documentary. It's called Bigger on the Inside uh, and it's highlighting disability awareness. Uh, especially disabilities that are unseen. Hmm. Uh, and uh, Ian kindly uh, contributed to it earlier this year, great fun. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we got the wonderful Anna Karen as well, um, as well as uh, unknown people uh, mm -hmm. giving bits and pieces. It's a very good worthwhile documentary and it's still in uh, production, you know, we're still okay. filming bits and pieces of it. So it'll be out sometime in 22, hopefully. Fantastic. And uh, just to, to, to leave you with it, um, do you have a favourite moment as, uh, as church or a favourite scene or...? Um, I, I suppose, I, I mean, I think, um, just trying to think of what, what the, what the, what the favourite scene was. I think, I have to say, the, 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 the one that um, pleased me the, the most was, was the very first time I appeared on mm. the set and there was this sort of because they'd done such a good job with my costume, because they'd done such a good with the makeup and the wig and everything. And mm. the most extraordinary thing about it that, that, that I remember is, is that we were working in this bunker, which was, um, which was a no smoking bunker. Right. That they weren't allowed to smoke in there at all. And, 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 and so 
what the what the special I said well I have a cigar I mean it's Winston Church he's got to have a cigar <laughs> and what, what the special effects people did it was very early days for the e-cigarettes and yeah. they come up with some sort of idea along those lines to make the cigar work along those lines and it was a fake cigar hmm. and they did such a good job of it but I can remember turning up on the very first day and them coming in through the front coming through a doorway and the whole set just stopped and looked and just went, oh, it's it's him. Churchill has appeared. And that was such a wonderful moment that people sort of recognized that 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 he was there. That Churchill yeah. had come in the door, you know, which was lovely. So yeah, that was the first moment that, that I appeared as Churchill, and it was such a good reception that I got that, that it was it was lovely. So no. So very happy memories. So listen, it's been lovely to talk to you. And I can leave you now with, with, with the capable hands of Simon Fisher Becker. All the very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. It's lovely okay. to see you again. Speak Thank to you again you. soon. Now, bye. 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 Oh, that was nice. Yeah, absolutely delightful. I have to say, it's, it's, I still have to sort of pinch myself, really, because when I was at drama college, hmm. Ian, Ian McNeese, because of his pedigree, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, I'd be very happy to get to his status at some mm. at some point. Um, and now uh, we're buddies. Yeah. It's, it's very strange, yeah. but lovely, but lovely. Uh, actually, he has the driest and driest of sense of humour. Mm. And once you get to know him, you 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 clock onto it, and then that what makes you laugh. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but um, a delight to work with. Yeah, yes, it and is. also very kind. Yeah, yeah, yes, um, yes. Yeah, lovely to give him to give up his time at that, and he, he could tell the enthusiasm he has for for those things. That's uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, he hasn't tried to get you on Doc Martin yet or anything like that. Or it's, see, people said that uh, I haven't. I haven't asked, although I have dropped a few hints. I said, <laughs> sure, surely, surely, Bert must have a cousin somewhere who can yeah. turn up. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd, oh, I'd, I'd love to do an episode of Doc Martin. Don't get me wrong. Hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's one of the joys of acting, though, having lots of different jobs and never knowing where you're going to go next week. Would would something long running be maybe boring to an actor? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, it depends what you mean by long running. I mean, in in my time, I have toured uh, in plays. Hmm. And musicals three uh, four months and uh, there was one for about 14 months so you get used to that hmm. uh, and I, I'm I'm one who just likes working and whatever jobs is offered hmm. um, uh, I say yes to and I tend to enjoy whatever I'm doing I'm, it's very difficult uh, uh, it is very difficult to think of a time where I thought, oh, my God, I really don't want to be doing this anymore. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, I'm sure there's been one or two moments where there's been friction uh, between hmm. the cast. I've not been involved, but, you know, sometimes people, other cast members can get a bit upset with each other which in turn can reflect on what's going on but I try to steer clear of all that sort of thing and I tend to gravitate to those who who are always laughing yeah yeah I suppose like any profession isn't it there's always things are going to be difficult we've got to sort of try yeah. and but um uh, I mean one of my one of my real joys is being in the green room with a number of actors and particularly those who are older than me and they're sort of remembering things and they're telling their stories of what they got up to or what they got involved with in the past and with actors you find that a lot of experiences of an actor who is 80 a 20 year old is still experiencing today uh, oh. and so you do get another uh, and which is really nice because sometimes particularly if it's something never negative happens and uh, there is a tendency to think, oh, is, is, what's, is it me? Am I the problem? So then getting to mix people and say, finding out that they had similar, if not the same problem, 40 mm -hmm. years ago, is a yeah. real relief. Oh, to, yeah. As well as those who could actually tell a story. Mm. Uh, yeah. and, and of course, 
the beauty of going on conventions, particularly if they're a weekend convention, mm. is you do get to meet up. And so there's a lot of Doctor Who actors. Mm. Uh, and there's Fraser Hines and Colin Spall, yeah. who've, kn who've known each other for the best part of 70 years. And um, the stories they tell, plus they are always telling jokes anyway. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and Sylvester McCoy is a very, very funny man. Yeah. Which uh, which disguises his uh, high intellect, really, mm. and he can talk quite seriously on a whole range of subjects, and so that makes things very interesting, and he helps put things into perspective. Mm. Um, but no, all all of them very interesting, and actors, especially actors, have been lucky enough to travel and meet other people and experience the lives of communities in other countries they have so much more that they can add to the conversation and help you sort of build your own uh, impression and understanding of what's going on hmm. uh, so i think we've had a wonderful um start to this evening shall we get on with the main uh, event and watch the episode? so we'll, we'll go for the main course we've had the hors d'oeuvre <laughs> yeah 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 um okay so have you got it on the uh, and I, I, I've got mine on iPad, and if you've got a, a copy... No, I, I've, got, I've got nothing to see, but I can hear it, and I, I can tell you stories. OK, because I can't, unfortunately, play the audio um, or anything because of the BBC uh, potentially, um, you know, suing me, that sort of thing. Um, but no, last, I know last time we got it on, um, on your iPlayer, I think. But, um, so I don't know if you want to... I can't it. remember what happened now. Yeah, because um, I think I, I did send you the, the DVD. Oh, it? yes, you sent me the DVD, but it arrived after we did the show. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, I remember that. Yes, it's not But, but uh, you just ask any questions you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so and what I'll do is, oh, sorry, uh, what I'll do, Simon, is I'll, I'll, I'll first play on the episode, so I'll have it as a guide to, to my questions, so... Um, I think that might be a good way to uh, to do it. Let me just quickly um, get in front of me. Um... I mean, the main the main thing I remember about Dorian really is uh, being in the makeup box, man in the makeup uh, hmm. uh, uh, carriage, as if it were. Hmm. Uh, I was very lucky, uh, apart from shaving my head the first day. Um, hmm. It was actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it would only take about 40, 50 minutes to mm. deal with my makeup. And then I had about another hour just to get myself into the frock. Mm. <laughs> so so I was so I was quite I was dealt with quite quickly when it came to costume and, and makeup. Um, lovely. Um, so I'm just gonna press play. So for, for anybody that's watching along in a live or on, on YouTube um, and they want to watch the episode in sync with me. Um, I'll just do a little countdown and then I'll press play so everyone's at the same. Um, so if I can't add anything, I wonder what I'm doing. Uh, so five, four, three, two, one, and play. So, so what sort of um, time would you be called um, on, on if makeup and costume? Very uh, do I think. Uh... Uh, somebody would pick me up from the hotel between seven and eight, I think, if I recall. You've got to remember this is 11 years ago now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or 10 years ago for this episode. Hmm. Yeah. So typically sort of, what, 12, 14 hour days? For... Yes. Uh, for those who, who think of all the glamour of our industry, hmm. the reality is it's these very long hours. Hmm. Uh, the BBC are very good at giving you gaps in between each call. Uh, mm. But sometimes other productions I've been on, you could finish around 10 o'clock at night uh, and they want you in makeup by seven o'clock the following morning. Mm. And I have to allow myself two hours to actually get up. Yeah. Uh, so it means I have to set the alarm for five. So mm. and you do that for uh, several days on the trot and your body starts to say hello I need to find a pillow <laughs> but uh, but you know the the adrenaline 
uh, and uh, the excitement of doing a project. It's not until you actually finish that you find out how really very tired you are hmm. at the end yeah. of it. Um, I was just watching uh, the, the beginning of the episode, and I understand what Ian was saying. It's quite a, quite a mad script in many ways. You've got different eras of history, the time is ripping apart, it's all sort of happening at once. What did you think when you, you, you read the script? Was, was it equally baffling for, as it was for Ian? It, it was baffling at first to read the script. Hmm. Uh, and then, <laughs> then when I actually saw the episode, uh, it was very much, ah, okay, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But we did, re we got to do a read-through. Ian wasn't there at the read-through, I recall. I, re I, I recall I had, to, I had to read in Churchill as well as Dorian at the read-through. But, uh, mm. but, you know, uh, a lot of criticism that was thrown at Stephen Moffat at the time was everything was so complicated. But uh, this uh, wedding of Ruben Song ties it all up beautifully. And yeah. I, I used to find at conventions that, uh, you know, the adults would say that it was so confusing. But I ended up saying, well, ask your eight-year-old son or daughter. They'll soon tell you. Because the younger yeah. audiences seemed to understand what was going on, but mm -hmm. not fully. They yeah. couldn't quite work out what the end would be, but they un did understand the concept of each episode, which was mm. good. Yeah. Because uh, would you have ever seen a, a, a rough version of the episode or dailies, or would you have just seen it um, as, an, as an audience on the podcast? Um, well, I was sent the script mm -hmm. and we had a read through about a week yeah. or two before we did it. Mm. Uh, and that was it. And so then I was only called in for the days that I was filming. Mm. Um, and with this episode, it was, if I recall, it was about three uh, uh, concentrated days. And it was only me and the doctor, of course. Yeah. Me, me and Matt, which was very exciting. But also what was slightly imitating, imitating, uh, intimidating, um, was I became aware of producers and other people coming on set to watch, ah, you know, okay. and so that was a, a thing. Mm. And of course, the very last line, mm. I can tell you a story about that when you, when you come to it. Yeah. Um, so, so were, were the producers coming on the set because it was a, 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 the series final? Was it that kind of, was it the hype of the thing or were they just there just doing their, their usual thing? I think generally they were doing their usual thing, but then when I was in a scene with other actors, you you didn't quite see it. But then I was the only one apart from the doctor, hmm. and that I, and because I was stuck in the box, hmm. I could see it. it's not as if. <laughs> and of course, they're all staring at me, but no, they're not staring at me. They're staring at the image of Dorian with his head in the box. Yes, yes, but. Uh, uh, I mean, even even Mark Gatiss turned up at one point in his Gantok outfit. Oh yeah, so, yeah. And I thought, what? What's going on? But uh, but there you go. Because it, you, you, I mean, you can tell when you look closely. It's Mark Mark Gatiss, but it is a very good, um, a good makeup. It's a very good character that he that he's mm. got. Um, uh, what was your impression of of, of Mark Gatiss? Oh, well, I mean, uh, I can't remember. I remember because we, we all shared the same hotel hmm. and whoever was on, you know, in on that day, they would sometimes double us up. Uh, so I got to go to the studios with with Professor Lazarus, as I remember him uh, yeah. <laughs> previously, uh, in the car. So he was very nice. And of course, I was slightly intimidated as well. Mm. Um, and when I feel intimidated, I can actually be a lot quieter than the image that I give now, sort of thing. But uh, yeah. so, uh, but it was exciting to be in the car with Mark Gators. It was exciting to be in the car with uh, Professor Lazarus, um, and it was uh, it was exciting that we we had little chats. Mm. You know, wonderful. Yeah. Um, and and when the episode aired, did you like to? Do you like to watch your, your work or are you a bit? When, um, generally speaking, before Doctor Who, 
uh, I would watch it if I was in, but I wouldn't necessarily go. I don't really like watching myself. Hmm. But when it was the Pandarica open, there was so much noise about Dorian yeah, uh, that I had to sort of watch it uh, more than once to try and see what it was that uh, titillated the fans. Hmm. Yeah. What is what is it that I'm doing? Because I couldn't work out. I was just playing a character hmm. uh, who I knew nothing about really for the Pandora Opens, other than what the script was and trying to read between the lines. Hmm. Uh, uh, and so what was it? What was it that intrigued the fans of the media? And Stephen Moffat does say that uh, part of the reason he brought Dorian back was because of the interest from the fans. Hmm. So yeah. thank you very much, fans. <laughs> so and that was very nice. <laughs> and of course, when he came back in A Good Man Goes to War, he loses his head. Hmm. And of course, I thought, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, and then I got the call to say he wants to be again. Well, of course, I was thinking it might be a backstory because yeah. there's been this thing about Dorian owing the doctor a debt. Hmm. Uh, so, so I thought it might be that. But of course, when the script came, it was completely what? What? You know, and went to Churchill and Cleopatra and what the hell's going on here? Yeah. yeah. I think that must be the joy of a, a Doctor Who script, but the Stephen Moffat script particularly, you don't know what you're going to be, it's, it's like um, a kid going to the biggest candy shop there is. It's, it's... Yes, and, and you know, it, uh, it's a bit like the current uh, series, this new series with Jodie Whittaker. Hmm. I think it's very good that it's um, a store, one story over six episodes, I think yeah. is, is excellent. So of course, things with them in the middle episodes might seem a bit confusing hmm. because you're saying, well, what's that got to do with what we've just we've seen previously? Yeah. But of course, it's like a murder mystery. Hmm. Fair, unless it's Columbo, you don't know who the dirty doer is right until the last page. That's right, yeah. So that's how I... Yeah. And me personally, mm. I love <coughs> <coughs> reading and watching and listening to things that, that make me think. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're currently watching the um, the catacomb scene. You've just the doctor's just opened uh, your your box. So um, yes. I mean, it's, a, it's a lovely lovely set. Um, did you did you like working in this in this set particular? It was a lovely set, but of course the actual physical <laughs> uh, uh, set that was on we've used before. Mm. It's just been redressed. Yeah, uh, and the simple way they filmed it—they filmed the plinth first. Yeah, uh, then uh, then they took the plinth away, mm. uh, and a chair was put in place uh, that I sat on, mm. and uh, then a large box with green bays was put in place, and I went under the box and stuck my head out the top, mm -hmm. and then they. Then they put Dorium's box on top of my head. All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I didn't realise was how uh, deep the box was. Yeah. So I suddenly had no peripheral vision. Mm. And I actually couldn't hear too clearly. Ah. And uh, it's something that I should have thought of, but didn't. I was too busy thinking about how I was going to deliver certain lines and why I was delivering the lines mm. uh, and the context in which it's in. And of course, these things are very often filmed out of sequence. Mm. Uh, so, but that's how it happened. But also mm. so that my face was in the correct position for the camera, I had to turn to my right and then turn my head back. So I was twisted like a double helix. Right. You know, which after a while was a little uncomfortable, mm. but uh, I just wanted to get on with the job. Mm. You know, I, I remember one person saying, you know, if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to, he said, you don't have to try and be professional about this. And okay. I thought, I thought I'm so I said, there's nothing to do with professionalism. I just want to get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I mean, you said the the the, uh, the set was, was was redressed from a previous set. I don't suppose you remember what set it was redressed from. Um, I'm just trying to tell what it would have been. But... Well, there were like a couple of scenes there. So me and um, not Kavarian. Who's the other one? Um, Neve, Neve McIntosh. Well, yeah, from the day uh, Dan Starkey and yes. Well, we 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 did a scene where we were walking down a corridor to a lift. Yeah. And I think in the end that wasn't used. Hmm. Uh, but Matt Smith did use it when he was puzzling over uh, over what men and women get up to when they're playing adult games. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, no, it was very exciting. It was one thing when the, uh, I did find fascinating was that they dressed the set with cobwebs. Hmm. Yeah. And it, and it's where I I discovered there are cobwebs in a can. And the oh, young yeah. and the young lady hmm. was a real uh, master craftsman because she had this way of just shaking the can, hmm. spraying it up in the air. And it came down and landed right on the spot uh-huh. that she wanted to. And she didn't do it once. It was almost every single time. It was quite fascinating to watch. Hmm. And the uh, the skulls moving back and forth again. Yes. Such, wasn't it? So uh, yes. um, I imagine perhaps a bit of a nightmare to sort of do, you know. Again. Well, the actual physical movement of the skulls, I wasn't around for that. Hmm. You know, it was, I was only around for the bits of the box. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we were saying uh, that. Um, so, so, so did you um, think that this would be your last appearance in in the show, or I suppose because the door had been you've been asked that a couple of times? Do you think, or well, maybe I'll get a phone call, or was it, or did you even have to think like that? You just have to well, I, I mean, as Ian indicated before. With something like Doctor Who, of course, you want to be able to come back as many times as as possible. But this uh, was definitely yeah. the end of Dorian's uh, story for the series. But yeah. there are a lot of questions. Hmm. Yeah. How yeah. does how does Dorian know so much about the Doctor? Yeah. What is what is Dorian's debt? Hmm. <clears throat> and. Um, I've dropped a few hints. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I remember saying uh, that um, Dora wouldn't have handed over the, uh, the Vortex Manipulator mm. to Dr. Song without having tried it first. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even, even if it was just the excuse, oh, I can't possibly sell anything unless I know it works properly myself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so there is the possibility that Dora could appear several times, you know, mm. every now and then, yeah. um, turning up at anywhere. And, of course, we really don't know who Dorian's first Doctor was. No, and because, it, because he knows so much about the Doctor, it makes me think that perhaps Doctor Who number 20 or 23 is, in fact, his first Doctor. Yeah. You yeah. know. Uh, it's just that. I mean... Uh, uh, firstly, that's me as a creative person wanting to my character to give it legs, right? <laughs> to be ironic in the context, uh, as well, of course, as wanting to pacify my bank manager. You know, well, yeah. no, no, of I mean, there's a you know, as a, anyone in the arts, you do actually want to earn your living mm. and give and given the opportunity. I've been very lucky that you know. Uh, I might not have as much money as some actors, but uh, at the end of the day, I have a car, I have my house, mm. and, and a reasonable extent, I have my health. Um, and I've reached the age of 60 now, which, of course, for 50 of those years, people were telling me I wouldn't reach. But half of them are dead. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, the scenes with you in the, in the TARDIS seem a bit more, um, a bit more complex um, because you're on a chair. There's no plinth, but it, it's a bit more, and you're upside yeah. down. 
that was a that was a that was a wonderful scene. Hmm. It was done on uh, separate days. Uh, Matt Smith uh, filmed his bit for, with that scene first, hmm. and he asked me into the TARDIS. He invited me in, hmm. uh, and they sat me underneath the console to deliver the lines. Yeah, to, to help him. And then afterwards, Matt was very kind. He showed me, <laughs> showed me that, and we played with the, all the the knobs and the handles and the whirly things on the console, and I loved it. I became twelve. Okay, and my favorite was the old fashioned typewriter, yeah, yeah. So, so that was a wonderful experience. Hmm. Uh, and then, as for me being head upside down in the box, mm -hmm. that was actually done in the last half hour of the entire production period, right? Uh, I'm not saying it was an afterthought, but it's just the way I was told, oh. We got 20 to 30 minutes to get this done. And uh, so they laid me on a table mm. that, that was low. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they, with my head in the box, they then put the camera above me mm. and then turned the camera around. So it was the camera that was upside down, not me. Right. Yeah. Although I was lying on my face. Mm. But, but it was good for, and basically, <laughs> They said, we haven't got time, we haven't got time, we'll just throw you the cue line, you say your next line. Hmm. Well, I said, fine, okay. Um, only not all the cue lines came in the right order. Ah. But, you know, I knew what the scene was, I knew what I had to say, and hmm. there was this momentary, oh, it's that cue, okay. Hmm. And, of course, they've edited it very well, and it basically it was one take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, but it's interesting when you're put in that position, how you can focus. Hmm. You know, and, and although I might think, oh, I could have done something slightly differently, I think it's a very effective scene. And uh, as a fan of Doctor Who, uh, that it's the nod and the tribute to Lethbridge Stewart. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I adore that. Hmm. And uh, a lot of fans adore that scene too so yeah 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 it, yeah, it, was, it was lovely how they made it such a pinnacle part of what happens in later on in the episode his decision to to stop running to face the, yeah. the reality of, was, was was wonderful um so what were your thoughts simon on the episode uh, as a whole when, when you first watched it did it did it meet your expectations as um as a, as a final um I think it did, because I, when I first saw it, of course, I'm watching it, trying to see how it all pitched, fitted together. So I had mm -hmm. to watch it a second time so I could actually enjoy it more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yes. And it was just a very clever writing. And mm -hmm. then I, you are saying it, particularly at that sort of how it all f uh, locks together from the previous episodes. Mm -hmm. You think, Okay, yes. The tess is it tessellators uh, yeah. and, and everything, how that all fits together. Um uh excellent really. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful episode and, and this the emotional journey and the heart and the, the, what the characters go through. Hmm. It, again, maybe something that the more modern Doctor Doctor Who series has lost a little bit, some of that. Emotional intensity, perhaps, but um... maybe. I mean, I don't know, really. but um, uh, it was um, uh, when it comes to that series, series six, hmm. it's difficult. I still think that the um, a good man goes to war is hmm. the best episode. But yeah. the wedding, wedding of River, River Song is very close behind, mm. in my view. Of mm. course, I would say that because I was in both. But, <laughs> but they were good stories. They were good yeah. revelations. Mm. And of course, at the end of the wedding song, you know, there's this question that I deliver, and it's mm. never answered. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I think, as you say, Series 6 is, has got those, those two wonderful episodes, but as a whole, 
it is a one uh, and five as well. I think are some of the best of the, the you know the, the the modern era of of Doctor Who, and um, I think a lot of that is down to Stephen Moffat's uh, Moffat's writing. I was watching um, I was watching this last night, and after I watched it, I thought I'll, I'll just watch the Time of Doctor because once you watch one episode of Doctor Who, you tend to uh, be drawn into it, and that was Matt Smith's regeneration story, yes. and. I was, I was, I went, we're not ashamed to say it made me, I was crying in quite a few places and it was, yes. you feel quite exhausted after. after yeah, after that. yes. Can I, can I just make one request? I yes. need, Mother Nature is calling, so I need oh. to disappear. I need to no, disappear no, for a couple of minutes. All right. Ooh, right I'll, see, I'll see you soon. Just for uh, for those that are watching uh, along, just pause the the episode at precisely the twenty two minute mark. So it's with uh, Amy and uh, the doctor on the uh, on the train, and uh, we we'll, we we'll, we shall resume uh, shortly. I'll be back in uh, one moment, sir. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. No problem. Uh, I just paused the uh, the episode for those that are watching, so I'll just yes. just start again. So five, four, three, two, one, play. So we were just saying for, before the break, Simon, about the emotional intensity that we had in, in Doctor Who in in this era, and most of it down to well, Rusty Davis had it in in his series, of course. Um, Stephen Moffat very much uh, continued that. Um, I get the sense that was Stephen Moffat quite a sort of, I assume he's quite a, a deep person, a thoughtful person. Um, did, did you get that, that sense? Um, I, 
I never got to sort of socialise with him as such. Mm. Uh, uh, but he was another one who did strike me as a not quite a recluse, mm. but a very inward thinking, and he's got clear ideas. He was yeah. lovely to me, uh, but you know, especially when you come back a second time and then a third, you are definitely mm. uh, being welcomed as a fem as a member of the family. Yeah. He, as the father figure, mm. clearly in charge. Yeah, mm. uh, and which, yeah, uh, intensifies the need for you to turn up, knowing your lines, roughly what you're going to do, mm. and get on with it. It's very interesting. Because uh, since Doctor Who, I've been invited to do various American projects. Yeah. And it is very true. I've, you know, I heard these stories before. But English actors, sort of as a challenge, like to get things done correctly first time. Mm. And with each take, they want to do. Whereas in the productions that I was involved with, uh, they didn't care if they, the American actors, gave the impression and the impression that they didn't care if they fluffed their lines. It was all part of it. Right. But, um, yeah. but don't get me wrong. Hmm. Uh, uh, as, uh, if you're playing a character, for example, that speaks very quickly, hmm. it's, it's, it's not difficult to, to you know, get tongue tied. Yeah. And uh, so although you know your lines, <laughs> it's your tongue that lets you down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but hmm. um, Yes, it is a challenge, I suppose. Mm. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, there are times where uh, I've messed things up as well. Because uh, your brain, yeah, the, the, the worst word for actors is action. As soon as they go, action, your brain goes, <laughs> who am I, where am I, what am I doing? Mm. But uh, you want to learn is when they say action, you give an extra beat, not just the one they want, but just give an extra beat for your brain Good to go, right, go. <laughs> now, I can give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can ask me the question again when we get to the last scene. Oh, yeah. And, and try and remind you. And just say, just say one take, okay. if I forgot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I also, you see, I enjoy watching other actors working. Mm, yeah. And and be, uh, for me, uh, Frances Barber as Madame Kavarian, I've, know, I've known her as a wonderful stage actor mm. for years and years and years. And, of course, I've seen her pop up in things on television in other films. Mm. So I was quite scared to be sitting opposite her. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there was definite, right, I've got to raise my bar here mm, yeah. because, because, because Dorian mustn't be, mustn't be seen to be weaker than Madame Kavarian. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and it is an excellent scene again. Mm. A lot of people comment, to, comment on it. Uh, and my husband, Tony, as far as he's concerned, that's the best, best scene. Yeah. <laughs> he rather generously... Use the phrase, it was two very good actors on top form. And I have to say, um, I didn't realise what uh, uh, what uh, Francis was saying. But uh, whilst we were filming hmm. uh, that scene, um, the following day she said she had, she had to do some ADR. And she said the scene, she said, she just nodded her head and said, very good scene. Hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with Frances Barber is a, a wonderful actress. Um, since we last spoke, Simon, I saw um, in Kellen's Hamlet in... Oh, Lisa, yes. All oh, right. And Frances uh, Barber was playing Polonius. Oh. So, so it was a gender... Yes. Fluid, um, no, age I, and all yeah. sorts of production and you know, marvellous in, 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 that, in that role. Um, a really, really great actress. Um, I, I saw her playing Julius Caesar. Oh. 
Yes, it, it was an all female cast. Hmm. And I thought, I was because it'd been in in London. I think it was the Dunbar Warehouse it was on, mm. uh, but it'd gone to America. Yeah. And I happened to go over to do a convention in New York, and so I sent her a message to say, you know, I'm just down the road. It'd be lovely if we could, if we could catch up. Mm. And I got the most wonderful message back from her. She said, uh, "We will make this happen, darling." <laughs> and she was very generous. Saw the play, absolutely stunning uh, production, and she was superb in my mind, but mm -hmm. I suppose I'm somewhat biased. But uh, what happened afterwards was what blew me away was uh, she said, we'll meet in a certain wine bar that was opposite the theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got there, and of course then there were other people uh, and she and uh, Francis was introducing them to me as her good friend. This is my good friend, Simon Fisherbecker. Well, I was floating on cloud 29, let alone nine. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, people say, well, how did you be? How do you know? And of course, I said, well, we were both in Doctor Who. And that was the, you know, the Ebenezer term to open the cave. It was absolutely... That was it. I was then in. And because I could say I was in Doctor Who, that seemed to elevate my status in people's minds. It's a, it's a very curious and wonderful, yeah. don't get me wrong. And, and I love meeting people. I love meeting the fans in particular. Um, and it's something I've missed, of course, uh, since March 2020. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, hopefully we'll get back to the conventions uh, next year, but you never know what... Well, we've got this new variant coming now, so... Yeah. It said Lord knows. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, the convention that, that Ian mentioned, I, I, I didn't go to the one he was at, but I've been to, 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 to those events, and, and they're quite nice because they're quite small. Yeah. And uh, when I was... There was one... September that I that I went to uh, sort of yes. the first events I went to um, since lockdown and um, yeah I felt quite comfortable in that kind of I wouldn't want to do these huge these huge ones at, at the moment I I don't think um, um, I mean I love doing the conventions and of course you're asked all sorts of questions hmm. uh, I think one of the strangest questions I was asked yeah. was um, why did you raise your eyebrow on a certain line. Ah, yeah. And of course, I, I needed a moment to think to myself, well, what line are you talking about? <laughs> I, and um, so so I, I just asked her, I, so I said, well, what was the significance to you? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she said, well, in raising your eyebrow, it changed the whole meaning of the sentence. Yeah. Right? Whereas I have to confess, in reality, I was probably thinking to myself, oh, what's the next bloody line? <laughs> and, and in doing that, I raised an eyebrow because I'm thinking, oh, you know, uh, because, because sometimes, not necessarily with Doctor Who, but sometimes, you know, scripts are changed at short notice. And, yeah. that's, the, and that's another challenge to deal mm. with. Uh, I, I was lucky, actually. I, I don't think my scripts were changed that much. Mm. So once I'd learnt it, I'd learnt it. Hmm. But it was just this strange question. And it came from a little girl. She must have only been about eight or nine. You know, it was, a, hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah. But there we go. And it's what goes through people's minds, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose what, what we forget is that as fans, we probably know, especially our favourite episodes, inside out, word for word, and... Yeah. Um, as an actor, you want it for a few days, then you go off, years go by, and then it must be quite strange for people to come along quoting things and knowing it more than... Yeah. Well, uh, not only quoting uh, from it, and of course, you've got to remember this, uh, the, the episodes I did were filmed uh, in 2010 for Pandorica Opens and 2011 for both um yeah a good man goes to war and the wedding of river song so that's now 10 years ago yeah 
Yeah. And I've done loads of stuff since then. So mm. trying to remember it all is a bit of a challenge, but that's all part of it. Mm. Uh, uh, but um, but it's good to the fans. But the other thing the fans do is mm. they come to me and some of them with photographs, which are clearly me, mm. uh, in, with other actors in something, and I can't tell them what it's from. Because ah, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, mm. because sometimes, you know, sometimes in the past I've been booked just for a day, or in some cases, half a day, just to do one scene on something. So, yeah. and then you go off and you're doing something else. Mm. Uh, and also, another thing that happens is you work under a working title, especially with projects that they want to be kept secret. Mm. Um, and so you never know what the real title is. Mm. And especially so if it just goes straight to DVD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I often get royalty payments for things, and I'm, I have to phone my agent up and say, "What's this? When did I do this?" And then, on the other hand, in uh, I did a, a project called Anavadechi Millwall, hmm. which in Spain is called something else. Ah. And I got a pay a royalty payment from Spain. Hmm. And don't get too excited. It was something like seven pound twelve p. <laughs> right and uh, but I couldn't think what it was from. Hmm. You know, I just couldn't. What is this thing? And it turned out to be out of a Dutch mill, but under a different name. Hmm. So these are our other challenges. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I, I was going to ask. Uh, so, so what, you've been to lots of conventions for, for for Doctor Who. What is the place you've been to? Maybe. Uh, uh, where you're working on there as a tourist that somebody's recognised you or or Doctor Who's been prominent. Is, is that ever sort of with um I don't I don't get noticed in the high street hmm. so much. Yeah. After Doctor Who I did do I did another series for the BBC called Puppy Love. And for about a month or so after that I was regularly recognised because basically I looked like me. Yeah. But because I'm not bald, well, I'm mm. very nearly bald now, but because I'm not bald and I'm not blue, mm. uh, people won't sort of think of me. Mm. You know, they won't sort of recognise me. But what does get recognised is my voice. Mm. And so yeah. I do I very often get people saying, you sound familiar, have we met? Yeah. <laughs> So, so that happens. Mm. Sci-fi fans, of course, especially as Doctor Who, and because they they regularly check my Facebook page or whatever, they, of course, know who I am. Uh, but what can be confusing is if I bump into them in the supermarket or in a situation that's not a convention. Yeah. And then they start talking to me as if they've known me for 20 years. Mm. And I'm thinking, and who the hell are you? What, what part of my life do you, what is, you know, and, and gradually it goes around and then it suddenly dawns on me. <laughs> uh, but there you go. I mean, it was that quite, obviously quite disconcerting to have somebody come up to you and, and, and they look at you like they know they've known you all your life almost. It, it must take a while to get, to get used to. Uh, yes, uh, but, but now, of course, now I'm a bit, a bit older, I can, I can sort of play the slightly dotty card. Uh, uh, and I could quite openly say, uh, uh, you know, oh, so, sorry, I, I, can you just remind me your name? Hmm. It's uh, I'm not asking that of my brother, right? Yeah. But uh, but so because I I do know if I've met you. Hmm. Yeah, I do. I'm very good at keeping remembrance of faces, but I don't always remember people's names. Hmm. But there you go. Hmm. But I'm glad people come, and I'm always surprised. At the numbers that turn up at these conventions, and even more surprised that they come to my table, and I'm very grateful. Uh, <clears throat> and for those who want to want to know, I was uh, going to ask how, how you got on with that because yes. last time talking about you were rushing to meet the deadline. So you... yes, yeah, so, yeah it's, well, as you can see, it's all happened. It's out now. Wonderful. Uh, we did have a few problems uh, uh, with potential litigation, so that's why things were delayed. Uh, yeah. and it's not as complete a volume as I would have preferred it for those reasons but um, it's still a mighty tone 
Uh, so if anybody wants let Zygons be Zygons, if you want a signed copy, mm -hmm. please either find me on Facebook or send me a message via my website, which is fisherbecker.info. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we could discuss transactions. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit uh, blown away. The book only came out about two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd managed to get myself a stock and they all went within two days. Oh, wow. So, so that was nice. Yeah. So, good. Uh, so I'm good. currently waiting for a fresh stock. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's a good time for Christmas, isn't it? So, uh, well, that's been my sales pitch. Yeah. A nice little stocking filler. <laughs> yeah. And so I've got the three books now. And um, if uh, those who haven't had the first two, mm -hmm. if they buy the first two, they get the third one half price. Oh, very good. Yes. Very because I have that has to be half price because because uh, uh, the thing I've learned being an author is you don't get free books. You have to buy them yourself. Okay. Now I buy I buy them through my publisher, Fantastic Books Publishing, mm -hmm. uh, at at their professional publisher's rate. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, what happened recently is uh, somebody sent me a hundred pounds. Hmm. Amazon voucher. All right, yeah. So, so I was able to go online and buy the, the books myself. All right. You, <laughs> you can make up to num become number one if you so choose. Well, well, no, it's, it's just then when I sell them on, it's 100% profit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, but there we go. And so uh, if anyone wants to send me gifts in the future, Amazon vouchers, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also accept Amazon vouchers if anybody wants to give me anything as well. <laughs> yeah, it was about any denomination will do. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> is there more writing on the cards for you, Simon? Uh, uh... Well, um, there are two or three. At the moment I'm working, we touched it with Ian, we're working on a documentary. Hmm. Uh, but I have got a fourth book coming up. Um, I've, uh, I've written a TV series called Hello Lovely, mm -hmm. and that's currently in the hands of a production company. Yeah. And I'm I'm waiting for the green light, hopefully. Right. <coughs> so, so watch this space. But uh, I do vlogs, hmm. and uh, called Simon says, yeah. <coughs> and I've had a number of people who have uh, hearing impairment, hmm. and uh, they they ask me if I can send a transcript. Yeah. So, so I'm actually going to write a book, and it's called "Something I Said." Ah, uh, yeah. Something I said. Brackets, two question marks, close brackets. So it can be something I said because it is something I said, or it, mm. or it could be something I said. And I've already, I've already got the front cover. It'll be this photo. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a photo. That was a photo taken during a dress rehearsal of a play called uh, Hamlet, Tragedy of a Fat Man right. by, by Paddy Gormley. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be the front cover. Mm. But, and I hope, I'm hoping to get that together so we publish uh, either before or just after Easter. Oh, lovely. Now, somebody just put up something asking about Hello Lovely. Can they put it up again? Because oh, I didn't finish ha Have you written a role for yourself in Hello Lovely? Yes. So you, you, no, it, it, I, it, it came out of a conversation I had with Ian hmm. because we've we've done a lot of conventions together. We've been on the same panels together. We get on well, extremely well. Uh, one of the little routines we used to have, because uh, uh, I, you know, me and Ian used to drive uh, up to conventions together, and we would go with one or two other people. And have an Indian meal on on a Friday or a Saturday night, mm. and in conversation, uh, uh, Ian did say it would be interesting if we could work together. So that mm. gave me an idea. So the so there there are two roles in it uh, with me and Ian, but also lots of other actors and I'm very pleased one or two actors I've written to well more than one or two have really given me uh, a positive thumbs up mm. uh, including a few Doctor Who actors so 
watch this space. Yeah, um, I, I know it, I know it may not be the, the most brilliant work, but I can tell you it's far better than some. Uh, but I'm probably saying too much and I'll be embarrassed because I can't get it off the ground. But uh, at the moment, um, Buffalo Dragon Productions are, are looking at it. Oh, fantastic. So. I wish you well with that, uh, with that assignment. It sounds really, really good. Uh, we're currently just at the scene uh, where the Doctor is, he returns your, your box to the, um, to, to the crypt and the big reveal. So I don't know if you want to talk about, about this scene. You said uh, one take comes to mind. Um, well, uh, have you got to the bit where uh, Doran says to the Doctor, he, he just uh, the doctor's just kind of explaining to Dorian at the moment how he how he survived essentially. So we're all right. So tell me, Doctor, how bad are my injuries? Oh yeah, yes, that was a lovely, lovely line. That was yeah. it. Uh, that was my favourite line. Yeah. But it, well, it, I didn't notice at the time, but I only saw it when watching it. Hmm. Was how when tell me, Doctor, how bad are the injuries? And then Dorian starts to laugh. Yeah, and then the doctor sort of goes. It was just the way he went, and he did. He said, "Okay, okay, yes, okay." That that moment mm. showed me, if not everybody else, that there's clear. Uh, they've clearly been a, together for a long time. Yes, yes, and cements the idea that Dorian knows a lot more about the doctor mm. than we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you certainly get that sense from the from the very beginning of, the, of their of their you know, appearances together. But yeah, little moments like that cement that. And that's to, to me, that's very clever acting, mm. unless it was instinct. Yeah. And and I must admit, there are things I've done in the past. People have asked, "Why did you do that movement or that?" Blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, e, e, without sounding too grand, if you're focused on what you're doing, mm. uh, and especially. If you're an older actor with lots of experience, things become instinct. Mm. And so a gesture is just what your your moment brings. And it's uh, it's quite exciting, actually. Yeah. And, and we just had uh, your lovely delivery of, uh, of, of, of the, the, the question hidden in plain sight, your lovely right. And did that just come to you? Was that a director's note? How they wanted you to uh, do the, it? The, 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 the dialogue is Stephen Moffat's dialogue, right yeah. down to the last dot. Hmm. Uh, but what they said uh, on the day that we did it, and again, it was another example, we didn't have too much time. Uh, uh, can you give us three or four options? Hmm. Right. And, yeah. and base, basically, it was one take per option. I can't really tell you. I can't remember what different options I gave them. Mm. Apart from one of them, I gave a sort of mad laugh. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I gave different options. And, of course, the option they preferred is the one you all know mm. uh, and has now become iconic. Mm. It's extraordinary. Is that something that, that, that fans quote you, quote to you? That oh, they're doing it for all that. And they say, say the line, say the line. <laughs> it's, and I do these cameo videos. Oh, yeah. And the Doctor Who fans always want me. And they say, they don't say, give me, uh, give, uh, please give a, a quote. It's yeah. please give the quote. Yeah. So, and to be honest, I've got no problem with that at all. Uh, and... Uh, I remember, I remember when I got the script hmm. and I was re reading it through and that last line, I turned the page thinking there was more. I couldn't believe that Stephen Moffat had given Dora in this last line and therefore me. Yeah. Uh, and it, I won't say I had sleepless nights, but it definitely hit me hmm. of the importance of that line. Because yeah. it not not only was it the last line of the episode, but it was the last line of the series. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the question was, who is the Doctor? Hmm. And then you go to the first episode of the next series, and it's, uh, who, who the bloody hell is Clara? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Where's she come from? You know, something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just to show how far Stephen Moffat was thinking ahead, I mean, the whole thing about the fall of the 11th and yes. and the where no one can tell a lie and, and then you watch that story 
Yeah. It's still there a couple of years. How the, well, how the... I think uh, it's interesting because I, especially during um, lockdown, I've been doing a lot more writing, and you do find that uh, you can't just start on page one and let it all spill out. It, there is a degree of thinking things through. Yeah. And and in the distant past, I used to write murder mystery stories for dinner theatre. Oh, yeah. So I had to work out who the characters were, how they related to each other, and their mot different motivations. So you had to sit and think about that mm. a lot. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I'm talking to other writers now. Uh, we all have different styles and different ways of working. Mm. But the, the one that has worked for me uh, is um, I do a lot of thinking. Hmm. <laughs> Somebody says, apparently there's a lot of money to be made from writing pantos. Well, it depends what you mean by a lot, really. Well, yeah. I, I suppose they're quite popular, aren't they? But, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, writers are paid per performance. Hmm. So if you write a script... Yeah. And there's and there's ten performances, you know. You get whatever it is now. It could range from thirty pounds to a hundred pounds, I think, mm. depending on the production, and some in some cases more, depending on who you are. Mm. But then, if you've got something that's got a twenty, uh, twenty, uh, uh, ninety-six performances or a hundred performances, that's very nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. But uh, yeah. But um, yeah, so I do a lot of thinking, and then when yeah, and and I've got lots of notes, and then I try and draw an arc of how the story should go, and what happens on the arc at each you know to each character, and at a certain level of the arc, and um, I then find when it comes down to writing it, hmm. I can actually write it quite quickly. Yeah, and then the rest of the time is just sort of going back, ironing out any. Uh, potential conflicts or things that might not work. So that's how. But I do spend a lot of time thinking, and I, I, I remember uh, my father-in-law referred to me as a mollusk <laughs> because um, he said, "You just sit there. You're not doing anything. You're so lazy. You're sitting there like a mo mollusk, not knowing that actually my brain is spinning hmm. with all sorts of ideas and how to fit it in." Yeah. Um, oh, yes, we had a question. Do you like writing uh, or acting in comic or more serious productions? Do you have a, a preference? Well, my preference is working. Mm -hmm. uh, I always, because, mainly when I started out, uh, uh, I was always thought of as the Billy Bunter type character. Mm. Uh, and it was always a comical turn. Yeah. Uh, and I freely admit sometimes even something quite serious, uh, sometimes I can make it appear more comical. Right. But I was very lucky that I was miscast in my view, but I was offered the role of Gerald in a production of uh, An Inspector Calls. Oh yeah. Which is a much more serious role. And from that, I won an award. Right. right, and uh, I found I was equally at home with drama and comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, on stage, comedy is wonderful because you get immediate feedback from the audience. Yeah, uh, but I enjoy it all. I I just enjoy telling a story, mm. and it is and live theatre, you know, is the best. But even in filming, there's sometimes uh, you film a certain scene and there is a certain spark. Mm. And you always know when you've done well because it's the crew and the cameraman in particular who will give you a thumbs up or give you a little applause. That's very nice. Because yeah. that's one thing that has happened since Doctor Who hmm. is I get less direction or whatever. Hmm. Uh, before Doctor Who, it could be quite tiresome yeah. because you get a director telling you when to blink. Hmm. But since Doctor Who, there's the assumption I know what I'm doing, so I get less direction. Right. So there's less conversation about character development and whatever. Mm. And so what I've learned from that is I have to do all the work myself, yeah. uh, choose myself 
which way I'm going to play it. Mm. And that's it. And so the only time there's any conversation is what I first offered they, they don't really want. To. And the, the phrase used is, can you give us another option? Whereas what I really need at that point is for them to tell me what, the, what sort of option they want. Yeah, of course. You know, and that's after all, that's what the job of the director. But it is very interesting that uh, the best directors I've come across for me mm. are those who used to be an actor or still are an actor, because they could communicate to an actor knowing what they need to know mm. or want to know. Mm. Those who've never been an actor don't understand why an actor is asking questions. Mm. <laughs> When it comes to, to, to the directors you had on, on, on Doctor Who, um, would they give you a lot of sort of uh, notes or were they more technical directors? Well, um, I mean, Stephen Moffat made it uh, easier because uh, for the Pandorica Opens, Dorium, large blue man, thinks Sydney Green Street. Mm, yeah. And for those of you who know Casablanca, Sydney Green Street was the large gentleman Signor Ferrari in a white suit and a fez, mm. who was a bit of a black marketeer. So from that, I knew exactly what Stephen wanted. Mm. I wasn't going to do an impersonation of uh, Sydney Green Street, but I, uh, I know that Sydney Green Street generally is quite still. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everything is done through thinking with the eyes. And I, and I think I'm hoping that's. I managed to get that across. So in that sense, it was quite easy to get, and there were no issues at all. Mm. And sometimes if they have to do several takes for whatever, generally a technical reason, mm. you know, I might offer something myself and then they'll say, oh, no, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said, well, I'm just doing something else. No, 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 we liked what you were doing. Mm. Right, but nobody tells you. <laughs> nobody tells you, see. Hmm. And then sometimes also what happens is you finish the scene, they say, all right, thank you, next, down to the next one. And nobody comes up and says, well done, that was excellent, that was very good. Hmm. Right? Although they might have thought that. I, need, I, I know, I'm, you know, I'm a precious little actor who yeah. just like people to come and say, well done, that was very good, thank you. That's you know, all. I think a lot of times in our lives, we, it's usually the... The negatives they get to us, they're not, they're not the, the good stuff, isn't it? So, I think. yeah, uh, and sometimes you know, something could go wrong, and it generally is something technical, right? Mm. Yeah. But when they're talking to themselves, and uh, uh, you know, and then they turn towards you, mm. they're not actually looking at you, they might be looking at something that's behind you. But being mm. a sensitive, somewhat paranoid lovey. Mm. You can't, so you start thinking, oh my God, the problem was me. What was it? What did I do wrong? They're going to tell me where it wasn't really at all. Mm. So you're very much an actor that likes to get that feedback. And, no, uh, well, I'm not saying I'm demanding you, but, it, but it, no. it, 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 I used to get it a lot. Mm. But more recently, I think what they've done is they, some people put me, uh, knowing what I've done, because on the other side of the coin, there's some people I could just fart and they think I'm being a genius. Right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, other, and they'll just accept whatever I do. Hmm. Whereas I have to, particularly younger actors who are just starting it, uh, younger directors, so I, I, I do have a little chat and say, hmm. if I'm not doing it quite like you would hmm. like me to do it, just say so. Yeah, yeah. And um, is directing something that you would like to move into or is it... Um, I, I, to be honest, I've not thought about it, but mm. having written a few things now that mm. uh, hopefully will go to production, there's part of me that would like to be partly a director or at least on board helping the director yeah. because I don't want them to not do what I've written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't want the director's cut. Yeah. Yeah. Um... We've got, I've got a nice comment I'll just, just read out to you. Um, we, we mentioned about Pancho, Pat Panto earlier, and um, one of the viewers is a, a particularly um, a, a fan of Panto, and he suggested that perhaps you and Ian could play the Ugly Sisters in Cinderella. Oh. Well, not to give too much away, 
but there is a suggestion of that in Hello Lovely. Oh, right. in the in, in the final scene, oh. and we did, to be honest, we have jokingly talked about it. Hmm. Yeah, and as with kind of something you like, you like doing. You've done a bit, bit of it. Well, I, I've done twenty. I've done twenty-three Christmas pantos and two uh, summer pantos. So I've done twenty-five, mm. and I played everything from King Rat to Ugly Sister and Dame. Mm. I, I do enjoy playing Ugly Sister very yeah. much, uh, I, and I've had the good fortune to work with uh, two, three very fine sisters. Uh, uh, there's a there's a Dudley Rogers. Who we, we went on as not only were we uh, sisters, but in uh, Dick Whittington, we were captain and captain's mate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did uh, five or six pantos together. Uh, there's uh, Reese, who is uh, uh, another fine Mancunian sister. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, would like to work with him again. But uh, we just have to see. Really. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, what else was there? Uh, I've done Panto a lot. I'd be happy to do it again. Uh, I did because uh, I, there was a, a year where I was out of action. Hmm. Um, uh, it was a bit of a, a challenge. Hmm. Uh, um, but uh, I hopefully next year I'll be working with Reese, Reese Ryan mm -hmm. uh, again in Manchester. But uh, who knows? We don't know what's going on at the moment in the world. Um, I'm I'm hoping. We, well, I'm not hoping, but I'm, I am sort of saying we got to accept that we're living through dangerous period because we don't know what these viruses are going to do. But at the same time, we can't close down completely. No. We must have live theatre back because uh, the one thing I uh, have learned during the lockdowns is uh, having been told, you know, that I don't have a proper job for 30 or 40 years, that you don't understand the realities of life, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Comes to lockdown, mm. who do people turn to? Precisely, yeah. yeah. They turn to the entertainers, the actors, the dancers, the writers, and, and the singers, and, and people who play musical instruments, and that's what they've been listening to on radio and watching on television. Hmm. So I would argue we've become an essential worker. Well, well um, I think actors and entertainers always have been, but as you say, there's yeah. a recognition. Uh, and I, I, th I think there's an inbred need to, for live entertainment, and it goes way back to the caveman. The caveman told stories. Yeah, well, count uh, and um, banged on stone or sticks together, mm. uh, and so it's it is in our DNA. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So there's so many wonderful lockdown content with um, people like Dave Jacobi and Kenneth Branagh doing mm. talks or or virtual or, or re readings of plays and things like yes. that. It's been very uh, been very good. So there's always new 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 uh, variants of art coming through. I, I think also what has gone uh, in education is to study and an appreciation of, uh, of uh, art. Hmm. Because, yeah. uh, because uh, the way certain people talk about, oh, we can't do that because we won't have so many viewers. Hmm. But what about the viewers who would like to have that? Yeah. We don't all like the same sort of thing. It'd be very boring if we did. Hmm. You know, and some things are very popular hmm. and some things appear to be less popular. But I, I argue there's always the phrase, the unexpected hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, somebody's taken a gamble on a project hmm. uh, and actually found that the, the audience likes it. Hmm. And it's very interesting, this, these... Um, there are these reaction videos and it's very interesting seeing younger people mm. reacting to shows and comedians and whatever you know of the 60s and 70s and 80s mm. and reacting to it 
uh, and you say to yourself, well, why aren't they reacting to what's going on today? Well, that must mean what's going on today isn't satisfying you. Right. Yeah, your point. Yeah. yeah. And as an artist, we must be allowed to breathe and experiment and do things. Hmm. Yeah. I think perhaps as a culture of people are taking less risk in terms of what is being being commissioned. And there's TV shows that you think, well, what's that doing on the TV? And your favourite show was cancelled. Well, or, you know, I mean, I could yeah. understand it. You know, there is a hit. Hmm. And so a load of production companies will want to try and make a similar thing in the same genre and uh, it's, it's never quite the same no it was a hit because it was something unusual and people were wanting to see something different yeah. and there is so much talent out there hmm. it's a it's extraordinary how much talent there is out there and the, and with all the channels that there are surely there can be sort of hmm. 10 channels that's just open to new and fresh talent and when I say new and fresh, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be very young. Hmm. It, it could be a new and fresh talent that hasn't had the opportunity, hmm. you know, to, to show their wares. Because that's another frustration I've got with these multi-complex cinemas. Yeah. You've got 10 screens. Hmm. You know, surely one of them can be an, an art house screen, surely. Yeah, you might say, so, yeah. Yeah. Um... Oh, yeah, the B so you had a comment, the BBC are nicely used to make a greater variety of dramas in the 60s and 70s than they do today, so that's a good yes. thing. And um, the BBC seem to do very little, and, and I, I don't know if you've heard, but from next year, Doctor Who is being produced outside the BBC system, so it's no longer a BBC, and the BBC is still own Doctor Who, but it's kind of being de-evolved. So maybe that's an indication of what's happened to, to, to the BBC. I, I don't know, really. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, have the BBC for years now, being uh, productions are being produced. The BBC just commissions stuff. Yeah. So yeah. is it an extension of that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the problem, I think, with, with Doctor Who, and you can see it as with Doctor Who's a very good example, because it's a big budget show, and... The BBC, I think, don't quite have the, never quite have the right amount of money and resources to, to make it. And I think for they keep knocking a number of episodes down, and there's longer gaps between series, and you get a sense that it's something that they would best if they sold it, but they could never sell it because they, you know, it's, it's a major part of them. So I think perhaps it's a financial decision to to let Rusty Davis and the production company. Get I mean, if, even even. Uh, I mean, in its height, in the new set, Doctor Who was one of the, the top three, wasn't it? Mm. For the BBC, selling yeah. worldwide. Yeah. And even now, I'm sure it's still in the top three. Oh, it's, it's got to be. You know, the, yeah. The and so, so, anyway. Oh, well, that's an interesting discussion point. Mm. Yeah, so. And I think also, because Doctor Who's ratings are a lot lower than, say, when... when you know, you're making the, the, the show and, and partly because it's been going for so long, there's a certain amount of maybe audience fatigue, but also there's so many more channels and so much competing content. And if you yes, think uh, I remember Ben Elton saying, because Ben Elton said uh, years ago, he said the problem with all these channels, hmm. it's just going, they're just going to offer the same shit, but spread thinner is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah. I hope I haven't to cause your show to be banned now by using that phrase no, but, no. Yeah, but but you know yourself i mean i'm i'm with virgin media and they offer me quote the full house mm. and it's you know it's 900 channels and there are days where i think oh i could sit and just watch the telly and there's nothing on that particularly tickles my fancy or i don't mind the plus one channels mm. uh uh, I don't mind the plus one channels, but but there's lots of channels. Hmm. Yeah, so some of keep competing, but as you say, the quad. Yeah, I, I've got certain um, streaming services, and you you have a look online, and you can't find anything to watch. So I think it is um, an interesting problem, really. Um, I mean, there were things. Uh, there was uh, programs. 
even now, I've seen some reruns of some old TV shows like the Tales of the Unexpected, hmm. and uh, some of them are, are extremely well written. Hmm. The production values are a bit questionable, but the actual storylines hmm. are top notch. What else? There used to be a series called Armchair Theatre. Yeah. Or the play of the month or something like that. We don't have anything like that now, no. which is a shame. And I did I did enjoy those. Uh, of course, there was the classic Upstairs Down series, uh, Downstairs series, which I still think is a uh, top-notch series. So you could watch it again today. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it puts Downton Abbey in, into a very dark cloud. Yeah. But uh, Upstairs Downstairs, brilliant. Uh, what else? What else did I used to like when I was younger? Um, all sorts of things. They were the usual comedy shows. Uh, but I also liked there. There was a thing called Out of Country, mm -hmm. and there was a, a wonderful character called his name was Jack Hargreaves, and he used to sort of sit in his shed at the back of his garden and just ramble on about country life mm -hmm. and how they dealt with certain things. I really enjoyed that sort of thing. Yeah. I was as a kid, of course, I enjoyed Blue Peter in the days of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're too young to remember Peter Purvis, John Notes, and Valerie Singleton. They they were my the hosts in my childhood, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed that. And Peter Purvis mm -hmm. uh, is uh, one of the actors who's very encouraging about Hello Lovely. Oh, that's so good. yeah, no, he's uh, he's uh, even. I got a message from him recently, just checking out how things are going on. So, because, um, of course, Peter Purvis started out as an actor and he was a companion to William Hartnell. He was indeed, yeah. 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 Uh, Stephen, mm. wasn't it, the character he played? Yeah, Stephen, Stephen yeah. Hayes, yeah. yeah. Right. And, um... uh, so, so, uh, so it's interesting. And, of course, I've been watching the, the reruns of The Saint with oh. Roger Moore. Yeah. And with those sort of programmes, I quite like to see mm. actors that are well-known now Hmm. In, in smaller roles of things they did in the past. Yeah, and it? another childhood uh, thing was The Prisoner, the original. Prisoner, yeah. The Prisoner. Um, for me, The Avengers, um, watching me under The Avengers on TV when I was a kid, that was quite important yeah. to me as a, as a show. Yes. Uh, um, I've, I've done a, a number of Avengers events, actually, sort of looking at the series. And, uh, and of course, yeah. Thunderbirds. And, bird, uh, yeah. and Joe Ninety, yeah. Um, yeah. I was like Captain St Scarlet and Stingray and and things like that, of course. So, um, and I think what's interesting about Peter Purvis's um, um, Blue Peter days was that a, a lot of the Doctor Who DVDs have got clips and stuff from his his um, his time on it because a lot of the articles he did on the show was covering the making Doctor Who after he left the show. So. Is his work um, preserved in, in that respect? I must admit, I'm looking forward to the original Prisoner to see if they do a rerun of it, hmm. uh, just to see if it's still got the mark. Hmm. Uh, you've, not, you've, not, you've not got it on, on DVD or anything like that, Sam? Oh, no, no, I've never been a collector of things like that. It just collects hmm. dust. Yeah. And, uh, well, you see, <laughs> this is going to sound... I work in the entertainment industry. I very rarely get a chance to watch telly. Like, for example, tonight, I'm talking to you rather than sitting in front of the box. Hmm. Um, uh, and, of course, when I'm travelling, it's not always uh, opportune to find time to actually watch. But I do, I have a TiVo box, hmm. which is currently at something like 79%. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to sort of take a day off and catch, yeah. and catch up on something. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, what what is interesting is mm. people refer to binge watching now. Mm. And it's actually something I've done for years. Mm. Because uh, sometimes I, uh, when a certain series was on, mm. I recorded it and didn't have the time to watch it at all. So mm. long after, long after it screened, mm. I would then get and then, and I quite enjoy the binge watch. Yeah. It's only a series to so watch it all together. It's, uh, it it ties yeah. up in a way that if you watch one a week, you you, you miss something that's uh, yeah. part of the part of the story. Um, right. 
just to, just to start to, to wind it up, Simon, I was thinking uh, with Doctor Who, are you struck sometimes by the, the power that the show has in terms of um, how it can influence people's, people's childhoods, their adult lives, the importance of, 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 of drama and acting? And do you find that you, you, your role is, as an actor and performer is, is quite important or can be to, to, to people? And is there a responsibility that comes with, with that as, a, as an actor? I, th I think there is, I mean, <clears throat> there's this discussion, isn't it? Does art influence a society or is art just reflecting society? Hmm. And I actually think it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the Shakespearean story, the stories really just tell us all about society, the different types of people they are. Hmm. Um, uh, as I've indicated before, I like I like stories that are very confusing, mm. so I have to think about it. I like to go away and think about it still. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, how important is it? As a as as a performer, it's important to be true to the character that you're playing, mm. and that uh, in, that that is more so if you're playing a particularly nasty character. Yeah, but uh, when you're playing a nasty character, you have to find the the root cause of their behaviour. Mm. And sometimes it's given you by the writer, uh, and other times you have to try and work it out for yourself. Mm. It's like Dorian. Mm. I, I think at his very core, Dorian is actually quite a decent chap. But he finds he can survive well in the murky world of black marketeering. Yeah. And I suspect, this is one of my theories, mm. is that maybe Dorian wanted to rescue certain people from a planet that was going to be destroyed. Mm. And the only person that could help him was the Doctor. Yeah. Because the TARDIS is the only thing that could take everybody. Yeah, mm. uh, And... Uh, so I think, and I think maybe uh, one or two of those people being rescued hmm. were probably family members. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, but that's my thoughts. Hmm. Discuss. <laughs> but it would definitely be one of my spin-off stories if I could get a way of getting it put out there. Well, I think we were, as we were saying at the beginning, Simon, we were trying to think of why your your character of Dorian is so. It's so, so fascinating and so popular and so it's so well loved and I think it's probably down to things like we, we, we know he's a good person at heart but though he is involved with this the sinister world and also I think because it's, it's so much intrigue surrounding his character because we know so little and there's little hints and little tidbits and and of course you get those wonderful lines as as well so and there's always that mischievous part to him that I think you, you you play so well so I think any character that's performed so well and also written so well you want to see see more of so maybe that's a part of the uh, of the success of it yeah indeed I I do uh, think because this year it's a uh, we've just passed the doctor's 58th birthday we have yeah and with all with all the streaming and the different platforms that things can be played on now, I I be very surprised if there'll ever be mm. a, a new program today, mm. starting today that will be around in sixty years time. Yeah, yeah. I, I because I, also I mean, but I'm talking as an older person now. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, for most of my life. Well, before I was 20, we only had three channels and then channel four came along in the in the early 80s. Hmm. And only three channels, my nieces and nephews said. And I said, yes, but there was an increased chance that you might find something by accident. Yes. Whereas now with 900 ch channels, it's a bit like trying to search for a needle in a haystack. Yeah, well, so unless there's word of mouth, mm. uh, word of mouth will become even more important now. Mm. But then again, as I've said, it's finding the time. 
Yeah, yeah, there's so much to absorb. And I mean, it's a bit like when you now get digital downloads of uh, of songs. The yeah. usual time you go and you buy an album and your favourite song was perhaps track eight, and you, which you yeah. didn't buy it for, and you lose some of that because of the yeah. accessibility, of course. Um, to, to wrap up, Simon, I just wanted to ask you what some of your favourite projects were that you've been involved with, perhaps on stage or, you know, TV, other, other than Doctor Who, of course. Well, it's difficult to choose one as a favourite because, as I've said, um, I just enjoy working and I very much enjoy. Um, uh, I could go there if I go back. Um, uh, my very first job uh, after getting my equity card hmm. was to play the Griffin in a production of Alice in Wonderland. Right. And I really enjoyed that because although I got my card, I was still relatively young in my career, if you could call it that. Hmm. So I was still on a steep learning curve. Yeah. Uh, and I got to work with some wonderful actors who were not household names, but extraordinarily talented. Hmm. And I learned an, an awful lot from them. Hmm. So that's, that's one production I can think of. Hmm. I just love doing Panto because Panto is in my... DNA. Hmm. Uh, I did a play, I'm trying to remember what it was called now. Um, uh, the Emperor of the Moon. I think that's written by Afra Ben or Suzanne St. Lever, I can't remember now. But that was very fascinating. Hmm. Uh, oh, I've done so many different things. Oh, one thing I really enjoyed doing hmm. was. Uh, an ungentlemanly act. It was a TV movie about um, about what uh, about the Falklands War. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, it uh, starred Ian Richardson, but in conversation, it turned out that Ian McNeese was in it too. Ah. <laughs> but and we we never knew at the time because we were on different days and different shifts, hmm. whatever. Hmm. But. Uh, but uh, so that was that was fascinating. Um, I got to appear in a three series of Hail and Pace. I don't know. If you oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. You, you know Hail and Pace. But for those who don't know who Hail and Pace are, they were a sort of another Morecambe and Wise. Very funny team. Very funny mm -hmm. team indeed. And uh, <laughs> the story there is. When I got my first showreel, which was VHS, that shows how long ago, mm -hmm. I went to Wardour Street in London to collect 10 copies. Mm. And I walked from Wardour Street and I was heading for Waterloo Station. Mm. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and I saw the, uh, well, it was London Weekend Television at that time, but mm. it became the ITV studios on the South End. So I thought, well, I'll pop down there. And I very cheekily went in, slapped one of my VHS showreels and just, just said, Hail and Pace have asked for this. Mm. And the receptionist kindly took it, took it and put it in an envelope, put it in a pigeonhole. And then about a month later, I got called to have a chat and I was offered a part in one of their sketches. And then, and then in the following two series, I got to be in one or two sketches. Hmm. Uh, and um, again, learnt an awful lot from them, and uh, it was really, really good fun. Hmm. Uh, and we had a good, a good comment just to say that Hell and Pace were in the last Doctor Who episode, the, the, the last story that Sester McCoy did. So it's amazing how all these things are interconnected. Um, yeah. Um, what was your favourite stage uh, role, Simon? My favourite stage role. Well, there were two, really. Um, I played Mr. Bumble in a production of Oliver. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a challenge because it's written for a high tenor and I'm a bass baritone. Right. But, we, but we got around that. But I did, I did enjoy that. I also enjoyed playing... We shouldn't talk about it, really, they say. Uh, I also enjoyed playing Duncan in a production of of the Scottish play. Oh, yes, yes. Well, um, I just enjoy everything. I mean, playing Gerald in an Inspector Calls was 
Firstly, an utter surprise, <laughs> because, um, you know, in the storyline, you know, he's a very handsome young suitor mm. uh, to a young lady. And, uh, and I remember when they offered it to me, because I went up to play Mr. Burling, because even as a young actor, I always got cast, or usually got cast, as much older. Yeah. So when they, the phone call came, they said they wanted to offer me Gerald. I remember saying, Gerald, are you sure? And I remember saying, this is Simon Fisher Becker here. Are you, are you calling the right place? <laughs> and I'm glad, they, I'm glad they didn't put the phone down on me. That's mm. all. Oh, dear. Yeah. I, play, I played a Smurf. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. In another production. Um, oh, it's so much. Uh, and you mentioned, so, uh, you mentioned singing, and so singing is something you've always liked. Like, no, no, I'm, I'm an actor who can hold a note. Hold a note, yeah. Yes, so, so uh, I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't done proper singing now uh, for some years, so I'm not sure I could still do it so well. But yes, I'm an actor who can hold a note. And I and I like doing comedy songs. I did a show of Flanders and Swan. I don't mm. know. Flanders and Swan were a, a duet in the 50s and 60s. Who they're one of the famous songs is Mud Mud Glorious Mud about hit the oh, yeah. right? and the Gnu song uh, and uh, many many more. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, there's so much stuff. And I've I have there's an awful and there's an humongous amount of work I've done working working on independent films uh, with directors and producers who've just come out of college. Mm. It's their first sort of professional setup thing. And I really enjoyed doing working with fresh talent mm. and, and helping them come up with ideas. And of course uh, uh, since Doctor Who of course, mm. they look upon me as Sir Simon Fisherbecker you know, Lord of the theatre stage, and they uh, they hang on every every syllable that I mm. say. Yeah. Uh, but once they've got over that, mm. it's it's very good working. I've, I've been working with a young chap called uh, uh, Luke Luke Allen. At the moment, who did, a, who did a short called "Reduced to Clear," which actually has its premiere on the tenth of December. Oh, lovely! Yeah, and online you'll find a "Reduced to Clear." Uh, improvisation. Oh, right. Yeah. So you go go and have a look at that. And there's two improvisations. Uh, Edward Tidy with another actor I can't quite remember, and uh, and then it's followed by me with uh, Dawn Baker hmm. doing an improvisation. What they wanted at the time was just a conversation that would be sort of muffled because it's supposed to be in the background in a hmm. particular scene. But yeah. um, it'll be interesting to see how they put it into, because mm. they've indicated that they liked it so much that they wanted to make more of it. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to the 10th of December. As, as will I. Um, I, I enjoyed um, Pandemic, the little short. Oh, the Pandemic, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Richard Calvert. Mm. Uh, very good. Now, that's an example of a young actor. Uh, I first met him doing a web series mm. uh, called Waterside. Mm. And so from that, he's gone on to do all sorts of other things. But yeah. the pandemic, I, I loved doing. He asked me to do it. I loved doing it. It was one of his early projects and big, and it won awards. And uh, because of that, uh, because of pandemic, he, he had been taken on board to do other projects. So I'm very chuffed about that for him. Yeah. Because I think that's on, on YouTube, if anybody wants to look it up, it's yes. um, a little short. Yes, it's about 10 minutes, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. I, got, I got nominated for awards, but I didn't get it. Ah. Yeah, but, but there we go. Uh, I mean, I mean do, do awards mean much to, to actors, is it? Or is it kind of a bit <laughs> uh, I don't know. I absolutely, but you know, this thing, the taking part is all that's uh, being nominated is enough. I say no bollocks. <laughs> uh, winning is what you want, but I, I have I have been uh, um, awarded uh, thing gongs, and and it's very nice to do so. Hmm. Uh, it is an acknowledgement that you've done something, and that other people deserve uh, it being said that you did something hmm. well. So that's nice, but. Uh, hmm. uh, 
whether whether I would kill my granny <laughs> or chop off my pet's legs so that I would win, hmm. I'm not sure. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was thinking of somebody, I think he was up for, for an Oscar, and he was saying that in some respects you, you want to win, to win the award because it gives you a certain credibility. So it can help your career. So the element of helping your career is is part of the um, is, is part of it. Um, my my penultimate question, Simon, was I just wanted to ask you about one foot in the grave. Um, oh, good lord! Yes. Yeah. Uh, when, when was that? It was nineteen ninety two? I think. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's something like that. Yeah. And uh, because I well, wasn't a lot of what you did cut out. I can't remember now. Uh, it was only a small role, anyway. Mm, so it wasn't much to cut. It was. It was one of my very first early TVs. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I was shaking like a boot mm. in the first uh, day of rehearsal to meet everyone. Uh, but it was good fun, and uh, we rehearsed it in what laughingly was called the Acton Hilton. Mm. Uh, yeah. But it was, it was it was rehearsal studios, which are no longer there now. Mm. Uh, so we rehearsed there. Uh, and then we filmed some of it before a live audience. Hmm. So that was that experience as well. So Very that's good. That's where your theatre background obviously came into it. Into I, I always say hmm. that, uh, particularly for comedy, hmm. actors that have performed on live stage hmm. uh, can do it better on film hmm. because they've had the experience of pause, pausing yeah. And knowing how, where a laugh might come. Hmm. Yeah. Did, did you always see yourself as 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 a theatre actor, and then television just happened to come along? Or was it always your idea to sort of dip in? Into that? Well, I I came into the industry relatively late, mainly because uh, if people read my first book, My Dalek as a Puncture, they'll give hmm. them the reasons why. Yeah. Um. And I was also given the impression, in fact, it was Denham Elliott, English actor Denham, who was. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he told me to stick at it because he thought I had a talent well, but people, he said, but probably people won't take you seriously until you're about 40 hmm. so of course I came away thinking, oh my god, I'm not going to get much work, so when I applied for a job and I then went for an audition and they offered it, I said yes and I said yes to everything that hmm. I was offered, so as a result I have a broad experience hmm across the whole spectrum of the industry and uh, and at the time my peers were saying no darling you have to specialize what mm. is your speciality well all those who specialized are out of work yeah. <laughs> because because now because basically yeah if you want to work continually mm. you have to be able to fit into whatever's been offered mm. and whatever's been offered may not necessarily fit your speciality yeah. So, so, and so I'm very lucky. I also enjoy audio work very much. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Tony has got a nice uh, setup in his music room. So I either go in there to record stuff or quite extraordinarily, uh, I've been invited. Uh, well, I've been doing it some time now. Uh, the Hawk Chronicles. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Hawk Chronicles and it's a, a audio a program produced by Steve Long in in America, and I and I came in as a guest artist <laughs> yeah. on episode one hundred and three, and I've just recorded episode one hundred and seventy two. Oh, well, so, so, so that's good fun, and that I record on my mobile phone. Wow. The technology is extraordinary, and where and uh, Steve uses actors from all over the world. Hmm. And he, we all do exactly the same sort of thing. And it's how he gets it all together. Hmm. Uh, so people, if you want to go in, go in and... I mean, I think 171 is up now. I'm not hmm. sure if 172 is ready yet. But uh, season seven, uh, episode 171, you'll get an idea. And you have no idea that the, none of the actors actually see each other. It's quite yeah. extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. And it, it shows yeah. the modern technology. Hmm. My, my final question, and we touched on it a little bit with Francis Barber playing Polonius, opposite I Ian McKellen. Is there a, a, a role, a particular role, or perhaps a type of, uh, of character that you would like to play in the future that you haven't done? And given that 
we are now in a sort of a gender age blind is is it more you know it does, does that make it more of a, of a possibility to do things that you wouldn't have well, before? I, I did fantasize about uh, uh, Toby Belch mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Malvolio hmm. but now we've got this uh, uh, gender cross thing that we could do now. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind having a go at Ophelia. Well, yes, it's quite enough, you know, it's, because um, I mean, do you, have you found in your, in your career that, well, I suppose we, we all are to a certain degree judged on how we, our appearance, our voice, our height? Yeah, yes, yeah, you can be pigeonholed quite, uh, hmm. what was the phrase they would say? Um, uh, typecast. Typecast, that's it, yeah. Yes, uh, you can be typecast. Uh, if I want to keep on working, then there's a degree you have to accept that. Mm. Where I don't accept it, for example, is um, there was something recently I was turned down for to do a voice work, mm. uh, audio things, and they said, no, we can't have you because you're fat. And they actually use the phrase fat. Right. Uh, I, said, yeah. I said, yes, but this is audio. Yes, but but you sound fat. Oh, yeah. What utter and complete utter bollocks, right? Yeah. Uh, so I said, look, if you don't want me just to say so, uh, otherwise you are getting very close to getting a pitchfork in your face. <laughs> you know, and because but this is the sort of nonsense you have to deal with. Hmm. Um, uh, yes, they'll only see me as a fat person. Well, that's fine. But, uh, you know, it, it does annoy me sometimes. Yeah. And I've had a similar conversation with Ian. That there'll be a... a, a uh, if there's... Um, uh, they could do a casting and they want a school teacher. Hmm. Say, for example, they're a maths teacher. Uh, I won't be considered unless... FAT is in, written in front of the character reference. Hmm. If they're a fat math teacher, yeah. I might end up in the top five to have a look at. If it just says math teacher, then nobody thinks of me at all. Yeah. So, the, so that's a bit uh, yeah. disappointing, really. Hmm. But then I don't fancy the idea of playing a math teacher anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is that sort of thing, and I don't know what the answer is to that. Mm. Uh, what I do appreciate is that a lot of time things are done at very last minute. Mm. So there isn't necessarily the time to do, for example, a proper casting. So, yeah. uh, so a casting director could quite ideally automatically go to people they know mm. or automatically go to agents that they know will have what they're looking for. Yeah. Or if they do have a little bit of extra time and they're going through spotlight, mm. if they're looking for someone for example, to be a barrister or um, a plumber, mm. if on the gallery of pictures that the actors put up, there is one of them, they are dressed as a plumber or a barrister, then that will increase the chance that they'll be called in. Mm. Yeah, that's right. They haven't got the imagination of somebody. No. no. Uh, I know there was many years ago, because I do have a picture of me as a barrister, because I was in a project where I played a barrister. Hmm. So that's up there. Yeah. <laughs> but the casting director called my agent to say, do you think, do you think Sam could provide us a picture with him wearing the full judge's wig? You know, hmm. which goes to show they're out of time because judges don't wear those wigs now. They wear the they wear the small ones, the typical barrister type, but they yeah. don't wear those things that you saw in Ilanthi. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there we go. Um I mean, and I, I know what you tell me. I, I saw Bradley Cooper on stage, and he was playing the uh, it, it was the Elephant Man he was doing. So, and and he, the, it starts with him um, with with no with nothing with, with no top on, so so topless. And Bradley Cooper, you know, keeps himself very very fit. And and the the doctor was describing what the conditions um, yes. Merrick had, and Bradley starts to contort his body and marvelous mm. transformation and yeah. you and within five minutes you are convinced that he yes. is that character so i don't think it matters 
what color somebody is, what size, what weight. Yeah. Uh, a good actor can play anything. I, I, yes. I would have said that. Yep. Uh, but what's also interesting, you know, you, you get castings come through uh, genuine Northern Ireland accent. Mm. Uh, genuine, uh, uh, genuine Northern Ireland South accent. Yeah. So uh, there, there's not the opportunity for actors to act anymore. Mm. You either look like and sound like what they're looking for okay, is is mm. very very often, and people can't argue with because I know it to be a fact. Yeah. Um, but uh, but there we go. No, I think we, uh, just, we just need more people yeah. <laughs> to write more parts for fat bastards. <laughs> well, well, Bradley Cooper wrote The Elephant Man. It, yeah. If he didn't write it, nobody yeah. would have passed in. So it's almost, it, it works on the opposite. It's like, yeah. it's more kind of difficult to get character parts because everyone saw him as this heroic leading man. So, you know, it can be, a, you know, whichever side of the coin you're on, but yeah. um, as an issue. Okay, well, that's absolutely fascinating. I, I must move on again. Yeah. So, uh, but thank you very much for asking me, and I'd be very happy to come again another time. Oh, I may hold you that time. And it's, uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed talking to you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for joining me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And according to Ian, who's watching, <laughs> he thinks it's an excellent show. So he's clearly somebody of a good taste. <laughs> we, we something right, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Speak to you again soon. Take care. Have a lovely week. And you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.